Hello, I'm Eric Corman, Communications Director at League of Education Voters and the parent of a sixth grade son in the public school system who needs special education services. In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education Voters is a statewide nonprofit working with families, educators, and leaders to build a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. We believe that education is a tool for justice. One of the systems that perpetrate racial injustice experienced by communities of color is our schools. We believe every child deserves an excellent public education that provides an equal opportunity for success. In order to achieve this, we must pursue radical change in our school systems for equity, justice, and liberation. We must build schools and systems that honor the humanity in every student. Welcome to our free online webinar series, Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series seven years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. Today's webinar is about why every family deserves a fair start. To access this webinar in Spanish, in your webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, click interpretation, which is the icon that looks like a globe. Then click Spanish. And if you want to hear only Spanish without the original English in the background, click mute original audio. Special thanks to Claudia Azar, who is our interpreter. If you have any technical issues, feel free to use the chat function, which I will monitor throughout the webinar. We also are offering closed captioning. So just click on the captions button, which is at the bottom of your screen. Early learning matters for our families, our businesses, and our future. Even before the COVID pandemic, lack of affordable childcare was costing $6.5 billion annually in lost revenue and growth. Strong investments in childcare, quality pre-K, and other birth to five services can make sure that all children are thriving and help Washington get back to work. Our presenters today are Washington State Representative Tana Sen and Senator Claire Wilson, prime sponsors of the Fair Start for Kids Act, which is House Bill 1213 and Senate Bill 5237. They will explain how their omnibus legislation will take strong steps to address early learning and childcare affordability, access, and the economic crisis. They will also answer your questions. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This is a space for you to submit questions to us. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the webinar quality to us on the chat function or at info at educationvoters.org. And speaking of the chat function, you're welcome to use it to check in and comment on anything you hear. I'm going to stop my share here. As a working mom with two kids, Representative Tana Sen brings an important perspective to legislative issues. She consistently advocates for busy families through policies that address education and community needs and seeks upstream solutions to prevent crises before they occur. As a state representative for the 41st Legislative District, Tana chairs the Children, Youth, and Families Committee and sits on the Local Government Committee and the Appropriations Committee. Tana has championed legislation to make childcare more affordable and accessible, keep our families safe from gun violence, close the gender pay gap, and secure access to mental health services and social emotional learning for our kids. Tana served as one of the first co-chairs of the Oversight Board for the Department of Children, Youth, and Family Services. After earning a master's degree in public policy and administration from Columbia University, Tana worked for 15 years in government relations and communications in the private, nonprofit, and philanthropic sectors before her tenure on the Mercer Island City Council. Tana serves as co-president of the National Association of Jewish Legislators, as well as on the board of HopeLink and the advisory board of the UW Masters of Applied Child and Adolescent Psychology Program. She has held previous board roles, the National Breast Cancer Coalition, the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle, Mercer Island Youth and Family Services Foundation, and the Island Park Elementary School PTA. Tana, her husband, two children, and their big black lab live on Mercer <laughs> Island. Senator Claire Wilson's legislative work has built on her 25 years at the Puget Sound Educational Services District, where she was an administrator in early education and family involvement. Prior to that, 
Clara taught pregnant and parenting teens at Mount Tahoma High School and was a senior grants and contracts manager for the City of Seattle's teen parent programs. Elected to the Senate in 2018, Claire quickly rose to the ranks of Senate leadership as Assistant Majority Whip, one of two lawmakers responsible for knowing whether key legislative proposals have the support to pass out of the Senate and when it makes the most sense to call them to the floor for a vote. As Vice Chair of the Senate Early Learning and K-12 Education Committee, Claire's extensive experience with education and families has informed a wide range of legislation. She has sponsored numerous bills to improve academic success by expanding access to childcare for teen parents attending high school and eligibility to the Early Childhood Education and Assistance Program. Her most ambitious legislation to date has been the Early Care and Education Act, a comprehensive vision of how to most effectively and efficiently coordinate the multitude of services available to help students succeed during their critical early years. Claire also authored legislation that requires the comprehensive, medically accurate sexual health education curriculum currently available in most school districts to be offered to students in all districts. In addition to her legislative roles, Claire serves on the Task Force on Improving Institutional Education Programs and Outcomes, whose focus is to improve the coordination and delivery of education services to youth involved with the juvenile justice system and the Washington State Leadership Board, formerly the Association of Washington Generals. The board operates Washington World Fellows, a study abroad and college readiness fellowship program, and collaborates with the Lieutenant Governor to administer Boundless Washington, a statewide program that integrates fun, challenging outdoor activities with leadership development training for young people with disabilities and the Legislative Youth Advisory Council made up of young people between the ages of 14 and 18 to examine issues of importance to youth. Claire identifies as a lesbian woman and mother and is one of seven LGBTQ lawmakers in the Washington State Legislature. A longtime resident of the 30th Legislative District, she has lived in King, South King County, since 1999. Her district includes Federal Way, Algona, Pacific, Milton, Des Moines, and Auburn. Welcome Representative Sen and Senator Wilson. Before we get going, I know Representative Sen will have a wonderful PowerPoint to show how the Fair Start for Kids Act works, the components of it. But Senator Wilson, I wanted to give you the opportunity to make some opening remarks. And of course, just as I'm ready to do that, um, you're going to hear my dog barking in the background because someone is walking by my home, which is uh, the downfall of virtual nature of this. But the upside of that is that uh, we're with all of you today, and I'm just really happy to be here. And, and I guess my opening remarks are, as you've heard, uh, both Rep. Sen and I have been working on trying to provide access and opportunity for families and children. Uh, the whole time that I've been in the Senate and I know the entire time that she's been in the House and probably one of the best experiences for me is the last few sessions being able to work together again cross chamber uh, making sure that we are uh, caring for and lifting up the voices of those not only that need service and support but those in the industry that have been providing service and support for so so long to kids and families all across our state. And that, you know, we are not an institution when we think about early care and education. We are informal systems coming together to meet the needs of families. And it looks different in every community, but the quality is there. And now we need to make sure the support is there as well. And as uh, you know, you mentioned early on, we already knew it was a problem. It's been one we've been trying to solve for many, many, many years. Uh, the pandemic has only exacerbated what we already knew. And so as we move forward, I think the most exciting thing with the Fair Start for Kids Act is it's not only Rep. Sen and I that are talking about it, but every other member that thinks about economic recovery and thinks about what it means to come back to work uh, and to come back to school, because uh, what this legislation also does is meet the needs of families who have school age children like your own. And that in the past, I don't think people really understood, understood that school was the care setting for children. And again, the pandemic changed that whole environment and the whole landscape as we move forward. 
So uh, as I pass this off to Rep. Sen, again, thanks so much for the opportunity. Um, hopefully you'll see that we have addressed the needs that we've heard from stakeholders that we've been working with for the really the past two sessions and that we will see things on the other side um, and be able to do some wonderful things for the state of Washington and the families that live here. Oh, Representative Sen, you are on mute. Thank you. That is going to happen a thousand times this legislative session. Thank you, Senator Wilson and Eric for uh, for joining me today or inviting me to join you and for focusing on early learning uh, as part of a key strategy to making sure that all of our students succeed. So um, as you have mentioned, what we know is that childcare is really part and parcel not only of education, but of the economy. Um, and like, there we go. And you know, needless to say, the benefits of childcare uh, are really front and center right now for businesses. We've been hearing uh, nonstop and been working closely with uh, the Association of Washington Businesses about their need for childcare because parents, working parents and students need childcare to go to work and to succeed. Uh, and of course, the, the importance of having some place that's high quality for those kids uh, is critical. So it's the business, it's the parents and it's the kids. Um, it's really also a key racial equity strategy um, unfortunately, you know, at least 50% of our kids uh, start kindergarten already behind, but that is just on average and our kids of color tend to be less ready than others as well. Um, also what's key to really think about in childcare is that it is a, a broken market. So when we talk about, well, why do we need state investments? Why is this happening? You know, small businesses who are these childcare businesses, they can't raise prices even though there's such high demand because there's only so much the parents can afford to pay. And so it's really, it's not a supply and demand traditional uh, program, it's a broken market. And um, we know this is a national problem. So it's not about regulation, it's not about early achievers, it's not about having high quality, it's about being a broken market. So a few years ago, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, along with the Association of Washington Businesses and a, a bunch of other groups, Department of Commerce, uh, looked at and to put together some actual numbers uh, related to the cost of childcare. And what they found, and Eric, you've shared this first number, is that the Washington economy loses $6 billion a year just here in Washington because of the lack of childcare. And that directly impacts businesses who lose $2 billion a year. And because parents are late, they're not coming to work because of an emergency at childcare, because somebody doesn't take a promotion, uh, they have to cut back their hours, a whole variety of issues that just directly affect businesses up to upwards of $2 billion. And when we talk about equity and we talk about um, struggling families right now and at any time, this is an important number. Parents forego $14 billion a year in Washington state because of lack of childcare. Again, they don't take that job. They don't take that promotion. They don't go full time. They don't get their higher ed degree, whatever uh, issue it is, they're foregoing $14 billion. So think about what we could do for our economy if we actually had childcare. Um, and that all directly means that we have a billion dollars less in tax revenue. So as Senator Wilson said, we know that COVID has, has impacted childcare even more. Um, we have so many essential workers and people who, who have non-office jobs that can't you know, can't stay home. And, you know, whether you're healthcare and construction, you know, teachers, whomever it is, they, they need to have childcare to, to go to work. Um, and so what has happened is that the risk has really shifted from schools um, who are closed to childcares who are open. And what that means is that you have all these uh, women of color, mainly in childcare, who have no health insurance, um, who are now dealing with school-aged kids and all the way down to infants, uh, all in the same place, trying to juggle with additional technology that they weren't trained for and they're not being paid for. And, um, and because of health reasons, we've reduced their ratios. And so that just makes it even uh, less profitable. 
And um, what we've seen is that a lot of child care is throughout this pandemic, and it's been, it's been wavering. So some of these are reopened and some of them are closed, uh, but we've lost capacity in our child care market uh, significantly. And something that I'm always very passionate about is the impact on women. We're really calling the COVID recession a she session. Um, there was some crazy stat in December that 100% of the jobs lost in the US were by women. Not 95%, not 99%, not most, 100% of the job loss in December were women because schools were closed, childcare was closed, after school programs were on vacation, right? Like, it was even worse than every other month so far. Um, but the beauty is we have partners like the Association of Washington Businesses and Amy Anderson particularly, who constantly says that economic recovery cannot happen without access to childcare. So Senator Wilson and I with hundreds of stakeholders uh, around the state have been working for the past couple years on the Fair Start for Kids Act. And this bill will really do uh, some main things. The focus is to really expand access to affordable childcare. And uh, the way that we will do that is we need to support the workforce first and foremost and expand supply. So that means more pay. That means healthcare. Again, imagine during this pandemic, childcare providers don't have healthcare. Uh, and making sure that they have the professional development that they need and can afford uh, in order to be in the childcare industry. We also know we need to expand childcare, and so that will require capital investments. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, businesses who are interested in childcare, whether they want to offer it themselves or partner. And so we want to make sure we're getting them technical assistance to do that as well. But you know, first and foremost, we also wanna make sure that we're making it more affordable for families. And so that means reducing co-pays. If you're a family who's receiving a state subsidy, uh, that might sound fabulous and, and it is helpful, but um, since regular you know, non-subsidized families are currently paying uh, more than for childcare than they would for college, we know that the state is not paying its the full freight and so that means families have to pay a copay, and that can often mean that they just can't afford it, even with the subsidy. And we also want to recognize that our state is more expensive than uh, than kind of the average state across the country. And so, working with state median income as a threshold instead of the federal poverty line uh, is really important, especially as our minimum wage continues to go up. We also, throughout this bill, look at the importance of dual language services because we have such a diverse population with more than 50% of our kindergartners uh, being children of color. Uh, again, with COVID and any other time, just making sure that we have mental health consultation and trauma-informed care in, uh, for kids who need it because kids are kicked out of childcare 13 times more often than they are even out of K-12, which is crazy and, uh, and disproportionately affecting uh, kids of color. Uh, the bill also does push out the entitlement for ECAP, which we have to do uh, just because there's just not enough of this capacity of workforce and of classrooms. And now with the pandemic, a lot of the schools where ECAP is um, have not been expanding or offering the ECAP that they have in the past. And all of this, of course, will be phased in over time. Um, but speaking of time, now is the time. Right now, this legislative session uh, in the next coming weeks, we must invest in childcare uh, for economic recovery, helping businesses and working parents, um, shoring up the struggling childcare industry, uh, making sure that our kids don't fall further behind, that they have the proper uh, childhood development. And this really is a strong bipartisan issue as you probably if anybody's been watching along on the House floor, uh, we've been having lots of debates that uh, Republicans have been joining in about the importance of childcare. And um, just, I'll end with this point. Washington State, we spend 1% of our state budget on early learning, 1%, what, even when we know is the best investment we can make. 52% is spent on K-12, 17% on higher education, but 1% under the age uh, five and under. 
Uh, and this proposal, Fair Start, has really been a partnership between the House and the Senate, but it's a huge partnership with stakeholders all across the state. Um, and again, I will just leave you with that. It, it's great to have a plan, but if we can't pay for the plan, then it's just a plan on a shelf. And so we need to have dedicated revenue, dedicated progressive revenue uh, that helps families just as much as childcare helps. And uh, so we've created as part of the bill a Fair Start for Kids account, again, emphasizing the need for dedicated revenue so that providers will actually enter and stay in the field so we can expand childcare. Um, and to that end, I did introduce uh, last week in the House, a capital gains tax bill that would be dedicated uh, half of it would be dedicated to childcare, and we will see how that moves along. But we are open to uh, whatever dedicated funding uh, our legislature could pass. All right, great. Thank you, Representative Sen. Uh, Senator Wilson, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I would say here, here, I agree with everything. And we do have, uh, you know, there is conversation around revenue because I think there is a deep understanding that you know we cannot it's it, we cannot have an austerity budget we cannot cut our way out of this and in 2008 when we had the last recession we lost services and supports and much of what we see today is the outcome of that and we know if we look back that we cannot repeat that um i also just wanted to say it is really an issue a, a women's issue and a feminist issue and uh the state of hawaii the women's commission there did a a study on the feminist uh, impacts and the feminist view of COVID. So, uh, you know, what Rep said and did say about uh, that is exactly true. It has been, you know, something that has impacted uh, women in a much greater percentage. So look forward to questions. Great. Well, thank you, Representative Sen, Senator Wilson. We do have about 10 minutes for questions. So for you who are listening, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. No question is too basic. The first question that I have is, Senator Wilson and Representative Sen, what are you hearing about how children are experiencing early learning right now during COVID? What is it like for them? Well, you know, I can, I can start, I can um, tell you one of my questions when I talked to families early on was, you know, they were deeply worried about, and more school, I think, school age than even preschool, but preschool as well. And, you know, my question to them is, do you have food? Um, and uh, do you have a safe place to live? And uh, do they wake up with a smile on their face? Do you have a book to read them? Um, and you have a chance to go outside. And if so, you're doing everything you need to do to make sure that they're okay. Um, but I also know that, um, you know, there has been, especially our state funded pre-K programs have continued to do um, virtual home visits and providing support services to families, meeting basic needs, food insecurity needs, needs around uh, learning kinds of uh, supports that children might need ongoing, uh, you know, mental health and uh, other kinds of counseling supports, um, but, and childcare have been put on, um, you know, really on full board doing all of those things that, you know, traditionally were done in many ways through school systems. So um, I, uh, yeah, and Rep Sen, I know you have things you'd like to say too. Yeah, no, I love how you describe uh, the needs of families and, and you know, what they're doing so many times when you're, you know, a young mom or mom with young kids and just, you know, make it through the day. If you get one thing in, you know, <laughs> that's an accomplishment, a meal, a shower. Um, and so it, it, it seems like that even under COVID, if you can even just get outside and get your kids fed, that's it's a huge accomplishment. Um, I would say that, you know, we, we know kids are struggling um, at all ages, but uh, you know, and as kids get ready to go back to school or think about having those social interactions again, um, there's anxiety there. And, you know, mental health is probably one of the things that we need to pay the most attention to during this, uh, during this pandemic and, and, and after the pandemic. And um, as Senator Wilson did touch upon too, there are wonderful programs that are continuing to go into and support families like home visiting, like home builders, like other things. So the Fair Start for Kids Act and childcare and early learning really 
just do want to emphasize that it's not just about um, child care, it's just also supporting families where they are and making sure that the parents have the supports that they need as well. Great, thank you so much. Here's a question about uh, rural communities. How specifically can we expand options for early learning and childcare in rural communities, many of which are currently childcare deserts? Mm -hmm. It's a real thing. I mean, you know, childcare deserts, that's the, that's the phrase that, you know, we've been using a lot. Um, there's even childcare deserts, which we tend to say underserved communities, uh, but in urban areas. Uh, but speaking to the rural component, um, a lot of childcare is connected with or could be connected with schools. Um, but also this is where the early learning facilities fund really comes into play to help provide capital dollars to build uh, childcare, to build community centers that are combined with childcare uh, and those sorts of projects so that we can make sure that there is a safe place uh, for kids to go and for families to gather. And so this is a huge strategy. Uh, during testimony uh, of the Fair Start for Kids Act in the House and leading up to session, it's been amazing to see how businesses are engaged. And even like in Clallam County, you know, the port there and the hospitals there have been, you know, talking about the, the desperate need for childcare because they can't hire you know, doctors and nurses because they don't want to move there or work there if there's no place for their children to be during the day, no safe, high quality place. And so it's really an economic driver. It's a, you know, a give and take. Rural communities need jobs. They need childcare in order to have those jobs. So uh, it's, it's a critical component to rural economic development as well. Senator Wilson, you want to add anything? Yeah, you know, the other thing is I think there's been a huge understanding that there's two sides to child care. One is service and supports to family, and the other is the industry and the business. And that we've not really looked at child care for years as a business, a small mm -hmm. business. And as a matter of fact, the first gig economy, if I actually think about what a gig economy is, and again, run by women, and women have never made the dollars that men have, it's, we still. Um, and so if you look at this, it's these informal systems. And so, you know, what I've seen in my conversations over the interim, um, I've been meeting with groups of superintendents from Eastern Washington, and in particular thinking about what kind of public-private partnerships and cross-system sector work can we do? Because oftentimes um, people get into the business of something that isn't necessarily their business but they get into it because they don't necessarily know where else to go or who else to talk with to do it. And this is the perfect time where we have providers that have the experience and the skill, but oftentimes they're looking for the place, the space, or the partnerships to be able to make sure they can have a business model that's, you know, keeps them going and sustains and maintains that support. So, um, you know, that would be also what I add. We have to look at each other as partners and provide services. This is not a poverty issue. This is an issue of services and supports, but we can't forget we've had communities and families that have never been served by this system, and now they have even less access than before. Yeah, thank you. The next question I have is about quality. How does the Fair Start for Kids Act address quality and continue to ensure that programs like child care and the Early Childhood Education and Assistance Program, ECAB, are receiving ongoing support to improve the quality of the services they're providing to children and families? So ECAP is the, uh, the kind of the state funded pre-K program as probably people know. And the beauty of it is it's the high quality nature. And there are lots of studies that show, and just a, one came out in December that showed uh, the, the uh, demonstrable positive effect of ECAP on child, child uh, readiness for kindergarten and their continued education achievement. Um, so ECAP is just a critical service and they've been doing great even during the pandemic, helping reach out to families. Um, and Early Achievers is the quality rating program that the state created, um, I want to say five years ago, but probably, yeah, about five years ago, to make sure that childcare is, uh, is high quality. And that is really what makes a big difference. Um, speaking to legislators across the country, and I was speaking to a colleague in Florida who was talking about how they expanded pre-K to uh, universal pre-K in Florida with zero uh, quality standards. And not that you know they were hoping for no quality, but they didn't put that into place. 
And he said that's their biggest regret because now they have statewide pre-K, but they have seen no, uh, no improvement in kindergarten readiness. Uh, and to add quality now is really hard. And so it's like, you know, you're doing a great job in Washington, making sure there's the quality as you expand. And some of that quality is about making sure that there's good training, um, making sure that there's kind of, cur cur you know, soft curriculum, um, but that there's, you know, guided work that teachers are doing with the children, that there's outdoor play, that they're safe, uh, you know, that they're doing kind of hand washing and teeth brushing. So it's, it's really a critical component and this bill definitely will support the continued investments in that high quality uh, early achievers. Great, Senator Wilson, was there anything you wanted to add? You know, all I would say is that uh, we need to have systems and a framework of support and a way to uh, be able to provide that support to providers when we ask them uh, to do something. And I know that, you know, I, I did the pi one of the pilots for early achievers, so I'm well aware of what it looks like from the ground on what it takes to do. So coming from a place of having to do that myself and trying to figure out what might work and what might not. But at the same time, we also have to fund what it is that we expect individuals to do. And what Early Achievers does is give us the place and the space to be able to put the money, to be able to fund, to make sure we get it out across the state to all providers who need it. So there is, um, it's an and both, and I think both um, have a role. Great, yeah, and, and I'll just add real quick too is that, you know, sometimes there's a, a concern as Senator Wilson said that it's, you know, that with more uh, quality requirements or some people would like to call regulations that that might add expense to a, a childcare business. And I would, you know, posit and I often use this example, which I'm not sure is the best given the situation with Boeing right now, but like in the aerospace industry, there's lots of regulations, right? Health and safety, making sure that, you know, the planes fly well, um, all of that regulations for pilots. And, but it's successful because we put a lot of money into aerospace and airplanes are expensive and training requirements are there and tickets are expensive and we have the FAA. And so getting rid of requirements and regulation is not what we need in childcare. What we need to do is pay childcare providers more. We need to infuse the industry with more dollars so that they can meet those regulations and those requirements, provide that high quality and make, uh, make a living wage and make it really a truly a valuable profession that people want to go into and stay into and, and have a business in. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Senator Wilson and Representative Sen, do you have a couple more minutes to answer a few more questions? Because I know we're uh, right at one o'clock. Okay, great. I got time for about uh, two more if you can. Uh, the first one is about private providers. How are we supporting the existing private early learning infrastructure as we do this? If we push all of our state dollars into solutions through public programs, we will decimate the existing providers who have invested their own funds to create their high quality programs. You know, that's a great question. And throughout this whole pandemic and throughout all of our conversations about childcare, we've been trying to emphasize that, uh, that childcare really, most of it is provided through small business. Most of it is private. And it's just that those private, some private childcare accept subsidy. So it's just about how you're paid, right? We, we you know, if you are renting an apartment, whether you have a section eight voucher, assistance from the city, you're paying for it yourself, your parent is paying for your rent, whatever it may be, you're paying the rent. And the same with childcare, there's, there's public funding, but it's going to um, private childcare. Uh, but not all private childcare accepts subsidized children. And even during this pandemic, we know that there is such a need for childcare. It's so important for working families and for business that we've been sending grants out to, uh, to childcare, whether they you know, focused mainly on uh, those who accept subsidy, but also really recognizing that we need to support all um, childcare if we have the, the capacity and enough money to do so. Um, and the early learning facility grants, we wanna encourage people to take subsidized kids because they're everywhere. Um, across our state. And so we really need to make sure that we have a more even playing field so that all families can go to work, get that job, those kids are ready for kindergarten. Um, so it's it's really a balance. But again, for the most part, um, by supporting and expanding the subsidy program, making it 
closer to market rate, we are supporting private uh, small businesses or childcare. Yeah. You know, the only thing I'll add is we also have family, friends, and neighbor in there because we also know that uh, many of our families are not, um, it is about choice and not all families are choosing family child care, nor are they choosing child care centers, nor are they choosing a state or federally funded pre-K program or child care yeah. or early care program. So it is about choice and it's about making sure that we're meeting the needs of children and families across the state as best we can, but we cannot do that without money. It's not an entitlement program and until it becomes one, um, it's about convincing people that it is the investment that needs to happen. Great, thank you. And, and the last question that I have here is about long-term strategies here. How do we ensure that the child care and early learning system does not revert back to business as usual in the months and years following COVID? What is the best way that the Fair Start for Kids Act addresses this? Uh, so this is really a long-term plan. Um, this is uh, lays out a roadmap of where we want to go with childcare and early learning. But if we do not have dedicated funding, that is exactly what will happen is we will rely on the, uh, the investments from the federal government who are giving us a boost, right, uh, in the hopefully that we'll get out the door soon and, uh, and this year, but those dollars are going to end. And so we really need to look at a long term solution again, to make sure that childcare are willing to stay in the field, to get their education, to be in the field, to build or expand their current practice, um, or else why would they believe that we as a state are gonna continue to invest uh, more in childcare when the history has shown we do not break 1% of our budget for early learning. And so dedicated revenue, uh, again, my plug for House Bill 1496, which is a capital gains tax is one option, uh, to make sure that we're using the, the proceeds of investments to make the best investment we can make so that all kids have a fair start. Senator Wilson, is there anything you wanna to add to that? Uh, you know, other than we have to invest and we invested as a state in our higher ed system, making sure that we have college promise for our students um, that are leaving our high schools and we need to have the same promise um, for all of our young families with children that are moving into our system. Uh, we also know the return on investment is well worth it. And I will also say it's exactly the conversations that have been happening in every single room. And people who have never talked childcare are speaking as if it has been a priority <laughs> forever and let them speak because that's exactly, I think, what needs to happen. And I'm gonna be also really honest in saying suddenly, it's also an issue of privilege where prior individuals with resource had access and could pay for what they needed. And we are suddenly in this pandemic situation where even if you had access to resource, you could not find what you needed. And so I think there's also a greater understanding of how important it is and how critical it is, even if you want it, that you can't always find it. And it is our job to support all folks um, who are trying to move into or come back to uh, a living wage so they can dream and be successful and support kids. So I just appreciate um, all the support of uh, folks I know that are listening today and of you as well and Rep Sen, because I think this is the time. We have been, uh, Senator Wilson, it's been such an honor to work with you and love the partnership uh, between the two of us and between the House and the Senate and all those we've been working on. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Representative Sen and Senator Wilson. And thanks to all of you for participating and submitting questions. I know I wasn't able to get to all of the questions, so I will share them with Representative Sen and Senator Wilson's uh, legislative assistance so that uh, they can look at that as well. If you would like to support the Fair Start for Kids Act, by the way, you can participate in our action alert, which I will include in our follow-up email that you'll be getting in about 24 hours. And if you'd like to support House Bill 1496, which League of Education Voters also supports, I will give you the link to do that in the follow-up email. Just go to ledge.wa.gov, type in 1496 in the bill info, and then you can sign in pro.
Our next webinar will take place Thursday, February 25th. Co-presented with the College Spark Foundation, we have assembled a statewide panel to address educating, I make that, advancing educator diversity, including Alexandra Manuel, the Executive Director of the Washington State Professional Education Standards Board, Dr. Mia Tuan, Dean of the University of Washington College of Education, and other educators and leaders from across the state. The registration link is on our website, educationvoters.org. Just click on events, then lunchtime webinars. I'll also share the webinar information in the follow-up email that will arrive in your inbox in about 24 hours. Also, the National Women's Political Caucus of Washington is dedicated to recruiting, training, and electing women to public office. We know women of color are the backbone of their communities and they wanna give them the tools that they need to run. They have an annual training exclusively for women of color and Lev is exciting, excited to share this information and it's a free training. The training will cover the basics to get your name on the ballot from fundraising to messaging with local campaign experts. Please join the National Women's Political Caucus of Washington March 6th online for a training or March 20th for a training exclusively for women of color. Please register at nwpcwa.org slash events. And I'll also include that info in the follow-up email. Thanks again to each of you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, please send them to me at eric, A-R-I-K, at educationvoters.org. A recording of today's presentation will be available on our website, educationvoters.org, and will be sent to you in the follow-up email. Please feel free to share the recording with your friends and colleagues. If you would like to learn more about League of Education Voters or support our work, please visit our website, educationvoters.org. Thank you again for attending. Each one of us has the right to feel safe and valued. Together, we will fight for a world in which true educational and economic equity exists. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Representative Sen, Senator Wilson, thank you again for joining us and for all you do to support Washington students and families. We hope to see you soon.